Coming up on this Tuesday edition of Daybreak, South Korea and the United States are seeking ways to reopen multinational talks on North Korea's denuclearization amid concerns over disharmony after Japan forged its own deal with Pyongyang. Korea's two main political parties are stepping up their appeals to the public and their attacks on each other as we head into the final day of campaigning before the June 4 local elections. Plus, hundreds of former comfort women and their relatives protest outside Japan's parliament, demanding Tokyo sincerely atone for its wartime system of sex slavery. Daybreak begins now. Hello and thanks for joining us. To our viewers around the world, it's 6am on Tuesday, June 3rd here in Seoul. I'm Mark Broom and you're tuned in to Daybreak. Our top story this morning, the chief nuclear envoys of South Korea and the United States have been discussing how to bring the so-called six parties back to negotiations to denuclearize North Korea. Prior to the talk, South Korean negotiator Hwang jung guk said... Seoul was consulting with Washington and Beijing about conditions to resume dialogue that involves the three countries, North Korea, Russia and Japan. This comes after the Chinese foreign minister asked South Korea to push to restart the talks ahead of Chinese President Xi Jinping's expected visit to Seoul this month. Huang and his US counterpart Glyn Davies will also call on Japan to remain committed to the three parties' cooperation on resolving the nuclear issue, despite having agreed to lift sanctions on the North if it reopens a probe into the abduction of Japanese nationals. Now, in just a little under 24 hours from now, polling booths around the country will open for the June 4th local elections. The country's rival political parties will make one final push to win the hearts of voters on this Tuesday, the last day of campaigning. But as our Guan Sua reports, both the ruling and main opposition parties are downplaying their chances of a big election day victory. Rival political parties are trying to figure out where they stand in key swing regions. Although the media is forbidden from releasing opinion polls six days before elections, internal polls within the parties are allowed and they suggest a number of tight races. The last official poll numbers from last week showed the ruling Senuri party had the upper hand in six regions and the main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy in five. But the ruling party now says it is only certain of victory in four regions and the main opposition party believes it has a high chance in winning in just three regions. Both parties are referring to their traditional strongholds. As there are less than two days of campaigning left, political analysts believe the two parties are merely trying to boost support and encourage voter turnout by suggesting they are facing unfavorable odds. This was also seen in their reactions to the early voting turnout on Sunday. The ruling Senuri party expressed concerns about the high voter turnout among young people, while the main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy said the number wasn't actually that high, considering that the majority of the country's 35,000 soldiers are part of the 16 percent of young people who voted in advance. Experts say voters in their 40s to early 50s will hold the key to the local elections this year. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. Now, staying with domestic politics, but at the nation's top office, President Park Geun-hye has asked her aides to make sure the delayed appointment of a new prime minister has no effect on state affairs. At a meeting of her senior secretaries on Monday, President Park said her push for sweeping reforms in the public sector can only be achieved when politicians and high-ranking officials lead the way. Introducing her new security adviser, Kim Gwan Jin, the Korean leader then asked him to focus on establishing a security posture and preparing for North Korean provocations. On government restructuring, the president said the duties of the National Emergency Management Agency and current security ministry will be transferred to the soon-to-be-established safety ministry, which will handle both man-made and natural disasters. 
Now, South Korea has rejected a North Korean request to return two North Korean fishermen who drifted across the maritime border last weekend. Three fishermen in their 20s and 30s were picked up by the South Korean Coast Guard near Ulungdo Island on Saturday. Uh, two of the three say they want to stay in South Korea. Seoul's Unification Ministry says the two men who want to stay will be able to do so. The third man is expected to be repatriated through the truce village of Panmunjom later on this Tuesday. Now, the previously icy relations between North Korea and Japan appear to be thawing, evidenced by Pyongyang agreeing to reopen an investigation into the fate of Japanese citizens it kidnapped in the 1970s and 80s. But what does this mean for South Korea? Our Hwang sung sat down with an expert to find out. Dialogue between North Korea and Japan could be a chance for Pyongyang to blunt cooperation among South Korea, the United States and Japan. In an interview with Arirang News, Japan Professor Kent Calder North of Johns Hopkins University said it's important for Tokyo to refrain from making any separate arrangements. Uh, the, the heart of cooperation, of course, is the, US, the Korea and uh, ROK and the United States. But uh, as a supportive element, Japan could be valuable. And so I think our three countries don't, can't afford to see North Korea drive a wedge there. Uh, that said, uh, generally, I think some pattern of dialogue, as long as there's coordination behind the scenes among the allies, is important. Professor Calder said dialogue is key to bringing back Japanese citizens kidnapped by North Korea in the 1970s and 80s. Five Japanese abductees were returned in 2002, but the fate of several others remains unknown. In other words, there could well be uh, Japanese citizens still alive in, in North Korea who never will be able to come home if there's not uh, some process of dialogue. Once fresh investigations begin on the Japanese abductees, Tokyo has promised to lift sanctions and to reconsider humanitarian aid to the north, reducing Pyongyang's dependence on Beijing. Professor Calder said the possible breakthrough is also a rare diplomatic achievement for Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, under whom Japan has seen ties sour with China and South Korea. I think we're at a, a period where the Abe administration realizes that it uh, can't be a player on Northeast Asian uh, geopolitical issues without uh, some uh, kind of contact or dialogue with uh, DPRK. Well, there has been Japan-North Korea talks, and Washington has also been conducting 1.5-track informal dialogue with North Korea. Uh, doesn't that leave South Korea out of the picture? Well, it's very important that uh, South Korea not be left out of the picture. That's absolutely the case. I've felt strongly for a long time that uh, the credibility of the uh, Korea-U.S. alliance is really the cornerstone of our position uh, in the Pacific and, and one of the key global elements. Professor Calder stressed the importance of dialogue, but said quiet consultations between Seoul, Washington and Tokyo must remain intact at any cost. Hwang sang Arirang News. Now, a former senior U.S. State Department official has endorsed Tokyo's push to exercise collective self-defense, citing growing security threats posed by China and North Korea in the Asia-Pacific region. Meeting with Japanese officials and the ruling coalition in Tokyo, we former U.S. Assistant Secretary clear. of State for East Asia, Kurt Both. Campbell, said Washington believes individual self-defense and police authority are not enough to handle new forms of threat in the region. The right to collective self-defense allows a country to take military action if an ally is attacked. Campbell stressed the US needs to boost defense ties with its two major allies, South Korea and Japan, whose bilateral relations remain extremely strained over Tokyo's historic denials. Now, hundreds of former comfort women and their families gathered in Tokyo on Monday to demand Japan formally atone for sexual slavery in its wartime military brothels. The now elderly women 
and the activists working on their behalf want a full and frank apology and compensation for the victims. Connie Kim reports. Victims of Japan's wartime sexual slavery from eight countries rallied in front of the Japanese Diet's lower house on Monday, calling on politicians in the country to settle the unresolved issue. On the sidelines of the 12th Asian Solidarity Meeting in Tokyo, around 300 former comfort women, their families and civic activists showed up for the demonstration, along with foreign embassy officials from 18 countries. Today's rally, there were grandmothers who visited Japan for the first time to speak about the horrific atrocities they have experienced. The Korean Council said that the participants submitted an appeal asking Tokyo to acknowledge that Japan set up and administered military brothels during World War II. They're seeking an apology and compensation for the victims and that future generations are educated about the historical atrocity so that it never occurs again. It was another opportunity to push the Japanese government to acknowledge their past wrongdoings and provide compensation through legal means. Following the public protest, victims will speak in front of seven universities in Tokyo on Tuesday and Wednesday to inform the younger generations that are unaware of Japan's history. Connie Kim, Arirang News. We start before the sun rises to bring you the latest stories out of Korea. We also lead the way with important global coverage. Stay on the pulse of what is happening with Daybreak. The chief of Korea's central bank says there is now higher expectations over the bank taking a more active role in sustainable growth and financial stability. In a conference Monday, Bank of Korea Governor Lee ji said the expectations were brought on by the 2008 global financial crisis. He added that more research is needed for the central bank to pursue different kinds of policy goals. While E said the global economy is on the path to recovery, slow growth in China and the high level of debt in Eurozone economies could pose a threat. A poll of 33 global investment banks and credit rating agencies has found that, on average, that they think the Korean economy will grow slightly over 3.6% this year. The Bloomberg poll result is lower than the 3.9% forecast by Korea's finance ministry and the 4% forecast by Korea's central bank. But it's worth noting that one third of these firms revised up their forecasts from earlier this year. And this suggests that they don't believe last month's Sewol Ho ferry disaster is going to have a real lasting impact on the Korean economy. Now, Korea's economic policymakers have been tasked with boosting domestic demand after the recent Sewol Ho ferry disaster. But a visiting professor from Harvard University says there is no real need for the government to intervene. Now, Huang Jie reports. Exports have been Korea's traditional growth engine, but balancing it with domestic demand rose as one of the key agendas for the Park Geun-hye administration to boost growth. The Korea Development Institute has even pointed out that the sluggish domestic demand is largely the reason behind the nation's strong current account surplus. One renowned economist, Robert Barrow, however, stands against the argument, saying it's not that big of a concern. With uh, Korea having become so rich now, I would expect imports to be catching up with exports and exports and imports to grow. Um, fairly much uh, together. He added that the deadly ferry disaster in April will have a temporary impact on the domestic economy and that the nation's pace of economic growth is strong enough. Those, Professor Barrow said, all take away reasons for the government to intervene. But still, the recent growth around 3, 4 percent is, is pretty good in a world perspective. So again, I don't see this as a rationale for government intervention uh, further into the macro economy, for example, in the form of further monetary stimulus or fiscal stimulus. Over on the recent strong Korean won trend, Barrow said the government allowing further appreciation of the exchange rate is reasonable. And I would allow further appreciation of the exchange rate, which I think has appreciated to some extent uh, over the last uh, few years. 
But he went on to say that the current level of the won against the U.S. dollar hovering around the 1,020 level could be the point where the local currency stops strengthening. Peng Jie, Arirang News. Now, the divide between large and small companies here in Korea is widening. The Korea Exchange said Monday that the combined net profit of firms listed on the main bourse increased 4.6% on year in the first quarter, while their overall operating income fell 1.5%. But the numbers tell a vastly different story when only taking the top 10 companies into account. They saw a rise in both figures over the same period, accounting for over 65%, two-thirds of the total operating income during the January to March period. That's compared with just under 61% last year. In terms of net profit, the top 10 companies made up 67.6% of the total, up from 62.4%, uh, racking up a bigger portion in that as well. Koreans work some of the longest hours in the developed world, so you'd hope retirement would mean some well-deserved rest. But a new OECD report shows the average Korean is still punching the clock, unfortunately, more than 10 years after the official retirement age. Our Song Ji-son reports. In Korea, you might retire from your main job, but that doesn't mean you're no longer working. That's the picture painted by the OECD's latest report on effective retirement age. The report notes the effective age of retirement is well below the official age for receiving a full pension in most countries. Some countries like Korea stick out, as while the official retirement age is 60, the effective age of retirement is over 70 for men. In many European countries, residents are actually retiring a good few years before their official retirement age of 65. Women in general retire a year or two earlier than men, but Korean women are also the ones working the longest after retirement, trailing only Chile. Korean women are working just as many years as men, effectively retiring at 70. Analysts say the figures clearly indicate how many Koreans cannot live on their pensions or savings alone, so they have to search for a new job in their golden years. Government data shows more than half of Korean men in their 60s were economically active last year, with 29 percent of women in the same age group taking part in economy. Song Ji-sun, Arirang News. Time now for a look through the international headlines we're following this Tuesday morning. For that, we turn to our Eunice Kim, who's standing by the News Centre. Good morning, Eunice. Good morning, Mark. King Juan Carlos of Spain has announced his intention to abdicate, paving the way for his 45-year-old son, Crown Prince Philippe, to take over the throne. In a televised address to the nation, the 76-year-old king said while he looked back on his 40-year reign with pride and gratitude, a new generation, people with new energies, must be at the forefront. Juan Carlos had been a largely popular monarch, but recent scandals involving his daughter and her her husband's alleged business irregularities and a Botswana elephant hunting trip he took amidst Spain's financial crisis had dented the country's confidence in the monarchy. Carlos became king in 1975 following the death of right-wing dictator General Francisco Franco and is honored for standing up for democracy in 1981, standing against a military coup. A powerful sandstorm has wrecked havoc in Tehran, killing at least four people and injuring some 30 others, according to state-run Erna News Agency. Enormous dust clouds engulfed Iran's capital city, cutting power and triggering traffic accidents. Some domestic flights were reported to have been diverted as well. Strong winds, at times rivaling up to 110 kilometers per hour, tossed debris around. Residents said darkness descended upon the city, taken by a sky turned dark orange from the thick dust. 
In the U.S., the Obama administration has proposed a plan、uh, to cut carbon dioxide emissions from power plants by nearly one third by the year 2030. U.S. President Barack Obama has said the ambitious plan would protect the health of Americans, shrink electricity prices, and spur the renewable energy sector. The proposal is also meant to reduce America's dependence on coal, which generates about 40 percent of the country's power. Critics say the initiative would cut jobs and hurt American competitiveness. The announcement comes ahead of global climate talks for a new international treaty that are set to resume next year. And violence continues to flare up in eastern Ukraine, where hundreds of pro-Moscow separatists try to overrun a Ukrainian border guard, triggering an exchange of fire for hours. It happened in the region of Luhansk, where military personnel were flown in to assist in staving off the assault. Ukraine's border service said at least five militants were killed and eight others wounded, while seven border guards were hurt from sniper fire. And a good Tuesday morning to you all. As we kick things off in the LPGA, where after three days of the Shoprite LPGA Classic, Pagan B is no longer the number one LPGA golfer. Despite a strong first day of the event, shooting a 66 on the day, Pagan B struggles a bit and finishes tied for eighth after three rounds of the event. Meanwhile, Stacy Lewis had a strong second day of the event after shooting a 63. Held on to claim the title after shooting a 16 under par. With the title finish, Stacy Lewis takes over the number one ranking while Pagan B's streak comes to an end after 59 consecutive weeks. And staying in golf, but over to the PGA Memorial Tournament, where Korean American Kevin Na came very close to winning the event, but fell short in the playoff. Now Kevin Na stormed through the final round of the Memorial Tournament, shooting a 64 and tied with Japan's Hideki Masuyama at 13 under par overall. But it was Masuyama who takes the title with a par in the playoff hole, winning his first American title. For Kevin Na, it was as close as it can get, but still finished runner-up. And moving over to football, where Park Ji Sung held his Asian Dream Cup 2014 charity football match on Monday in Jakarta, Indonesia. Now. Quite an entertaining match for all the fans out there, as some of the biggest names in the Korean entertainment industry took part in the charity match. And even Park Ji Sung was quite surprised to find out that Cha Bum Gun got some playing time as the South Korean legend subbed in at the 78th minute. And a match that also included Jean Luca Zambrota, the Indonesian All Stars, won the match 3-2. And now, with that finishing things off in baseball, where the KBO named the MVP for the month of May, and it was none other than Park Byung Ho of the Nexon Heroes. After a monster month, hitting .321 with 14 home runs, 27 RBIs, and 26 runs scored, the Nexon Heroes first baseman received 14 out of a possible 26 votes and was named the month's MVP. The slugger, who's won back-to-back -back league MVPs, is currently hitting .309 and is currently leading the league with 21 home runs. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day, and see you guys again for your sports needs. Good morning. I'm Lee Jihan with your latest weather updates. Well, lingering rain clouds from yesterday are dropping showers, so most of us are waking up to rain this morning, and it's forecasted to slowly let up from the upper parts of the region. And we won't be able to see the sun today. It will be cloudy day today with rain. And temperature-wise, other than Seoul metro area, readings will be hovering in the low 20s. So 
it will be uh, chillier than yesterday across the region, so please dress accordingly. With that in mind, let's take a closer look at the readings for today. The morning low here in Seoul is starting out at 18, and the high in the capital will rise to 26, while Daegu tops out at 22, and Gwangju and Pusa should climb to 23 and 21 later on. Now let's see how other regions are looking. Down on Jeju, you should see a high of 25, and Daejeon and Dokdo will reach 23 and 22, while Mount Kungang tops out at 19, uh, 13. Well, that's all for now. Don't forget to take your umbrella, and I'll be back with more updates after 10. Those are the stories we have for you at this hour. Korea Today is coming up in 30 minutes' time with more news, and we'll be back at the same time tomorrow. Until then, goodbye.